All right, this is our fifth and final section for Unit 9. Um, we're going to cover the early part of the Cold War. We will come back to the Cold War when we get to Kennedy, then we have the, a section on Vietnam, and then we will have a section with, um, for the Nixon presidency, and then in the 80s and early 90s for the end of the Cold War. You will notice there's a lot of standards, and there's, this is one that we have historically a lot of questions on the EOC about various things, basically the end of World War II going into the Cold War um, in this time period. For our bracketing dates, this is where we definitely, for 1945, as the war ends, um, unofficially a lot of people will say, a lot of historians will point out that the Potsdam Conference is kind of the unofficial beginning of the Cold War. You can get, trace back even further than that. And then we have for 1957, for this section, when Sputnik is launched, which is the height, and the next, next five years or so will be the height of the Cold War. A section we had earlier, but coming back to it, was the founding of the United Nations. Um, even though the Cold War is going to be against the, United, the U.S. versus the Soviet Union, this is a time that we are working together. Uh, there is a General Assembly. The purpose of the General Assembly is to try to create peace. A lot of the ideas that were written in the League of Nations for Richard by um, Woodrow Wilson now come to fruition with the, the UN at the end of World War II. Now, the Security Council and especially the permanent members of the Security Councils each have a veto. And thus, each one, and they will be able to do it, and it's to make sure that we don't have um, a, a the democracy overruled. Because if you think if there's 200-something nations, if all the smallest nations join together, they can op overpower the most powerful ones. So that's why they have the veto, to make sure that you don't have that happen. Um, there's an old saying about, demo about a problem with democracy is if you have two wolves and a sheep vote on for what's for dinner, you can see what happens there. Um, over time, there has been abuse that has been done by, by various nations when it's come to the to the, this um, veto. Um, the United States, we use ours to protect Israel, the Soviet Union, later on Russia with Iran, China with North Korea. Uh, a Floridian, and one that's written um, in our EOCs that we had earlier with, which as part of FDR's Black Cabinet, but in the founding of the UN, this is where probably our first Floridian truly important and in, in not only U.S. but world history, where from starting from World War II on, Florida will be extremely important in U.S. history. But with Miss Bethune, um, with Bethune Cookman College, is one of is named after her from one of the schools that she had founded. But this is where for for her, she is a part of the founding of the UN. Um, there. All right, another thing we had earlier, but this is this is where you need to to remember the Nuremberg trials because although we have this separation between between the the Soviet Union and the United States, we are working together during this time period um, there. So that is there aren't a lot of things cooperation, but this is where some of the starting in the UN, the, the Nuremberg trials. Meanwhile, what ends up happening in the last part of the World War II? As the Americans and the Allies were approaching from the West after D-Day towards Germany, the Soviet Union was coming from the East. As they went through those smaller nations, such as Poland, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, they will then go and set up puppet governments. That is one of the reasons why at Potsdam that President Truman did not trust what, what Stalin was doing um, there, because they had broken their promise of allowing free elections. Now, what will end up happening is you'll hear these terms, East Europe, Soviet bloc, behind the Iron Curtain, um, all of these are, are the same, same areas of these satellite puppet governments that, that the Soviets will have. Now for, uh, for Germany, and this is where I showed the video, um, the, that one that was the cartoon, but really good for kind of showing with the Berlin airlift, but they also told for beforehand. Germany was split up into four different occupied zones, and so the, the U.S., Britain, France, and the Soviet Union each had a section. We also had a section in Berlin that was, was set up. What ultimately will happen will be that the, the three Western European um, areas, or the U.S., British, and French occupied zones, will join together and ultimately be West Germany. Inside Berlin, there will be th the three parts that were occupied inside Berlin will be part of West Germany, even though it's completely surrounded by Soviet-controlled East Germany. And there, 
and East Germany will be will be part of that um, satellite nations or Soviet bloc. Now, here's where for you all that this is truly history. I mean, this is as if we're talking about Spartan, Sparta and Athens. But for most anybody that was born before 1980, this is something that they were used to. They knew of two Germanies. I mean, the Berlin Wall, which is symbolic of it, and basically the time period that they, they will reunite was 1989. So again, if you were born before 1980, you knew about it. When you watched the Olympics, there was an East Germany and a West Germany um, that we'd have. We're going to come back to various things with the Berlin Wall um, in a little bit. But again, this is where we have the different sectors of where Germany was taken apart. Asia afterwards. Japan will be, be on, under control, but it'll be just the U.S. for occupying it there. Because in the Pacific War, we had Australia helping us, but we were pretty much on our own. The Soviet Union does move down and goes into, into a little bit of Korea before the atomic bomb is dropped, which we'll come back to what happens for, for Korea. For the Philippines, we will end up make it, letting them become an independent nation, which we promised them in 1898, but we finally came through after World War II. Now, both Japan and the Philippines will have it where the U.S. does have protections of them. Uh, for a while, we did not allow uh, the, the Japanese to have a military. Uh, we will later on allow it and actually encourage it because we need them for more of their own protection uh, than we have. For China, this is where, where it's your world history comes in together. So, during World War II, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong both led armies that were fighting the Japanese. But once the war ended, those two armies started fighting each other. Now, long story short for the world history, but where U.S. history comes together, is Chiang Kai-shek was fighting for democracy and the nationalists. Meanwhile, Mao Zedong was communist. Ultimately, the communist and Mao Zedong will win, and you see in that map, that big area of red, that will become the People's Republic of China, better known as Red China, or Communist China. Now, the United States, we will not recognize that. We will, not say, we will say that is not China. Meanwhile, you see that little blue dot, the former island of Formosa, which today is Taiwan. We will say that is China. So a billion people living in communist China did not exist for us officially, but that little island was China. And Britain, France will also support that. And this is where, where China was in the, in the UN, well, it wasn't communist China. That will not be, it will come about until the 1970s, and this is part of when we get to ping pong diplomacy and with Richard Nixon in there. Yes, we need Forrest Gump to help us to get to that point. Now, what's the effect on Truman when this happens um, there? This is where, for Truman, it, when China falls to communism, people are saying that he's soft on, on communism. And it will, it will make for his philosophy from then on and what will become known as for containment because we do not want for communism to spread. All right, the Cold War itself, we generalize it as a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. Again, there is no official start date or end date, but if you were to pick, to pick some dates, most commonly Potsdam that the, or the end of World War II, and then usually in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union will break apart. Some people will place it earlier with 1989 with the Berlin Wall um, at, at that, that time. So, Our early roots was before this. I mean, at the end of World War I and our distrust of communism where we had the Red Scare. And again, in Potsdam Conference where Truman, we, we, one of the what ifs in history is what if FDR would have lived? Could we have had a better relationship with Stalin with FDR than Truman um, that you would have? Now, debated over time period has been, was Truman soft on communism? Was he, where some people say that he was actually too harsh? Which, at the time, when Truman left office, he had one of the lowest approval ratings ever of a president. Today, he is considered one of our greatest presidents. And one of the things that has made that change is a lot of people will look back and see a lot of things that Truman did were not popular at that time, but were for the best for the country. So. This is where he took more of a middle road um, and was not a hardliner against communism, but he sets the tone and actually his policies is what every president all the way through Reagan and Bush will use when it comes for, for that. All right, our first battle was coming back to something we had in the notes earlier uh, with World War II, but at the end of World War II where we had paid for and helped Western European countries 
rebuild. Did I talk about it at that time and it seems silly. We just spent four years bombing the heck out of them. Well, no, we are trying to. So we rebuild what will be West Germany. We will help our allies. Now, when we do this, there are strings attached. The countries cannot be communist. They must be capitalistic and democratic. <clears throat> so this is where I have that question. Was the Marshall Plan actually a, a, a plan against communism? And yeah, it's, a, it's an economic battle. We're going to, and you can call it a bribe, but we are setting up that world where we not only are the center of it, but it is against communism. All right, the Truman Doctrine. Um, as after the war ended, we, we saw, and after China, um, Truman will end up doing this doctrine. And the one thing that you need to, to know with this is the idea of containment. We want to contain communism um, here. The, and what had happened was to start this will be Greece and Turkey look like they were going to turn to communism. And we will aid them. And like the cartoon on the bottom, you have Uncle Sam that's blindfolded in a little bag of money says aid to Greece and Turkey um, here. And this is where we are going to try to stop the spread. We don't want China and the Soviet Union's influence to go. One thing I, that I didn't learn in school, because this was not known until after the Cold War ended, but at that time was the National Security Council um, memo, which was uh, NSC 68. And what it said is we will not only do this, we'll support this uh, militarily if we need. And after the Korean War starts out not so good, you will, if you see graphs, you'll see a dramatic rise in the amount of money that is um, sent to, uh, that is in the military budget um, at this time. The main thing, this term domino effect, and this is where you kind of think with, with containment again. We're dominoes. We don't want one place to fall. And an example of this will be Vietnam, because like when Vietnam does fall to communism, so will then Laos and Cambodia, and Cambodia next to it. But the Truman Doctrine will be one that will be used by every president, no matter if Republican or Democrat. They each have their own versions of it, but it will be the one that is, that is used all the way through um, the 1990s with, with Bush. Uh, I showed the extra history um, cartoon. This is actually really good about showing the beginning of the Cold War, NATO, the Berlin Airlift, um, there. So where I don't give as much net on the notes for this. But they really emphasize a lot of things. Stalin was using where he was cutting off West Berlin. He was using that and kind of, it, again, it's, it's a part of our one of our little proxy wars. We are not actually fighting the Soviets. Um, they cut off the war, the road and the railroad. And the military had said, well, we either need to drop an atomic bomb um, there or we need to withdraw. And um, Truman will end up deciding to use this um, airlift. And what ends up happening is where three, four years before we were bombing Germany, our, our pilots and the British pilots, we're going to have them working hand to hand with the West Germans. And Stalin's plan to kind of separate us and, and get the people against against the Western Europeans will, will backfire um, as what will end up happening is that we will unite and West Germany will definitely become part of that Western Union that we have. The pictures you see there of our candy bombers, which are the, the video they were telling about that, where we will have pilots as they're flying in and out, will drop little parachutes of candy that we have. All right, the atomic arms race. This is something that starts during, I mean, basically, once we drop the atomic bomb, other nations want to have it. One of the mistakes of dropping the atomic bomb that has been looked at is, if we never dropped it, if they didn't know what, what, how powerful it was, would another nation have made it um, there? So once we showed the power of it, other nations wanted to, the Soviet unions will be trying to get it. And there's kind of questions of how do they do it so fast, um, even though it took them the same amount of time as us, Part of it was they're accusing that we have spies. And we'll see later on that the Rosenbergs actually were, or one of the Rosenbergs were part of spying, so they did have a little bit of help that way. Um, but this spurs on, and then what, what will change, what would possibly be World War III, will be a nuclear war. And that is why the Cold War, we will not have the U.S. and the Soviets actually go at each other. It's going to be a lot of proxy wars and economic and influence that we have. 
because the Soviets are going to make an atomic bomb, we will make the H-bomb in 52. A few years later, they'll make an H a hydrogen bomb. Then we make a neutron bomb, they make a neutron bomb, and, they, and so on and so on. Our bombs get more and more powerful, and then we get it where later on for the development of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which I know it's not really in the notes in this section, but that's going to be really important um, there and the idea that, that we have for it. What will end up happening is World War III, we will know, and the term that you, terms you need to know here are brinkmanship and massive retaliation. The idea is if you do something to us, we're just going to bomb the heck out of you. And ultimately, with the Soviets and the Americans um, going after each other, we have this point of, by the time we get to the 1980s, what's known as mutual, mutual mass destruction. If we are to have this war and we were to all launch our birds, um, and there, it would be something that would destroy um, the, the Earth. I know there's one estimate that said between just the U.S. and the Soviet Union, there was enough nuclear weapons to blow the world up four and a half times over um, that you have. All right, you should know what a gang is. And the idea of a gang is that if you, if you attack one person or gang, the entire gang is going after that. Well, this is what you need to know where the EOC is going to term it as collective security. So we have our gang and the Soviets have their gang. Our gang is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The US, Canada, and Western European countries um, there. Meanwhile, the Soviets, they have their, their gang, which the Soviets are the leaders of that, and the Eastern European countries. We're also going to emphasize NATO, you're gonna see later on CETO, the South, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. And again, it's another one that's more focused against China um, that we have. Make sure you know NATO, Warsaw Pact, the idea of collective security. All right, the Korean War. Um, another one that I will show actually a Mr. Betts uh, meme story that's really good at telling a lot of the history side of it and the details of it. But one thing you do need to make sure that you know, that you know if you ever see 38th parallel, whether we're talking about the Korean War or we're talking about today, that is North and South Korea. What had happened at the end of World War II is the Soviets had taken over the northern part of, of Korea and the U.S. took over the southern part. So the dividing line was the 38th parallel. In 1950, the northern part will attack the southern part, which was seen as a civil war. But Truman will see this as part of something that he needs to stop with the spread of communism. He will go to the U.N. and, and the Soviet Union at that time was pouting about the Russia um, decision, or sorry, the China decision that was made, and they did not use their veto, and U.N. decided to send troops to, to aid where South Korea was, was attacked by North Korea. Uh, when I say UN troops, well, they were almost all American troops that were there. And in the beginning, we don't do too well. We were very soft um, from our occupation. Uh, this is when we will also see that some of our equipment needs to be updated, so we will have, have it where we, our military budget goes up a lot. And General MacArthur from World War II, the hero of World War II, will come back, he'll take over, and he will end up pushing the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel. Uh, he will want to go and even attack China, and, and Truman will end up sacking him or firing him. Um, he comes back a hero, and Truman's seen as the GOAT. But once again, this is where when we look back in history, and the idea that the commander-in-chief is to have the military, and to keep the generals under control. So, um, But this forgotten war, as it has, eventually will come to a, a ceasefire. Technically, North and South Korea are still in a war today. They, are, they have never had a treaty that was signed. That is why no president would ever visit or give, give basically the response to, to the leaders of North Korea until Donald Trump came. And that is where he attempted to try to bring them together. Uh, as of today, they still have not signed the peace treaty. And the deals that were supposedly made for the nuclear weapons have not come about as North Korea has actually increased their, their nuclear weapons um, that they had. Once again, though, when you see 38th parallel, that is the division in um, North and South Korea. All right, after Truman, we will have President Eisenhower. He continues on with the Truman Doctrine with his own version. Now, we will be focusing more on the Middle East, and this is where, after the Suez Crisis, we will get involved um, in the Middle East. Um, we kind of look back in history and say this was a turning point as, as we, Eisenhower pretty much says, we're in charge of this area and we take claim of it, which, as you know, even up to today, that was, that's an area that's had a lot of problems. 
Some of these you can blame on the United States, but a lot of this is just historical. In fact, actually more of those can be where when they were colonies, we, we put them together in various areas. So someplace like Iraq that has Shiites, um, Shunis, as well as Kurds that were all just geographically told that they were all in one nation. So some historic rivalries that we have against different groups in there um, that we have. But it has not been too successful for the United States, which we will going to see starting in the 1970s, going to be very involved in our foreign policy. For Asia, after China and Korea, this is where we will establish CETO, again like NATO, but the purpose is for collective security. Um, eventually, this is where for the, do the dom domino theory um, there that we will get involved in, in Vietnam, but we have an entire section in our next unit for that. Meanwhile, we also are getting involved in North and South America, especially in the South American countries and the Central American countries. And those of you that know of black ops, there are going to be a lot of black operations that are done. We will, we will be involved in assassinations, the CIA is involved. Realistically, we have this, the big stick policy come out again, but instead of us sending the Marines, a lot of these were done secretly with the, the CIA. 1959, though, we will have, where we're trying to contain communism, we will suddenly have 90 miles from, from Key West. Cuba will overthrow their government, um, and Fidel Castro will, will lead in the, the communist revolution. For the middle class and the richer um, Cubans, all, many of them will end up leaving. A large number of them will go to Miami, um, the, the little Havana area of Miami. Later on, we'll have other Cubans join them. Um, in our section on, on JFK, we will go and we will study where the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis that occurs after that. But in 1959, we saw this as a problem, but, but Fidel Castro will just go and overthrow and get it. Um, unfortunately, that happens in Eisenhower's president, and Castro will continue on from Eisenhower to Kennedy, to Johnson, to Nixon, to Ford, to Carter, to Reagan, to Bush, to Bill Clinton, um, they are all the way through um, at that time. Um, here's a map again this of CETO for, for our, our idea of collective security. 1957, we have Sputnik flyover. A little beep, beep, beep scares the bejesus out of the Americans. Now, what was the problem? Well, we thought they were ahead of us. In some ways they were, in many ways we were technologically um, ahead of them. Less than a year later, we'll, we'll have Explorer 1 come up, and the Explorer 1 was a, had a lot more technology than Sputnik did. But this is where Americans are like, how are we now behind the Soviets? What do we blame? Well, it's our school's fault. We're teaching too much liberal arts and poetry and those things. So this is where we start to focus more on math and science um, there. And then we are also going to have colleges do more research. We will have in 58, we'll consolidate um, for our for things and make, and make NASA. Uh, I've spoken in class before about the man on the moon idea where our purpose for JFK was not to actually put a man on the moon um, in there, but that was to inspire the American people to support what will be the technology for an ICBM. Because if we can send a person to the moon and bring them back wherever we want to the world, we then will be able to have the same technology to launch a missile with a warhead and drop it wherever we want in the world. You don't have to know the names for the EOC, but really as an American, you should be familiar with Alan Shepard, who was the first American in space, not the first man in space, on um, there. John Glenn, the first American in orbit, and Neil Armstrong, who was the first man on the moon, famous for the one stall, small step for our man, one giant leap for mankind. Um, again, we don't have the first man in space because Yuri, Yuri Gergen was um, in that, but we will have the only people that have been on the moon up to today. 1960, things are really getting, getting um, pretty, pretty tense in the Cold War by this time. Um, this is after Cuba, and what will happen is we will have this spy plane that is shot, in, shot down, the U-2 spy plane. The Soviet Union says they shoot down our spy plane. We deny it. They show us wreckage. We still deny it. Then they trot out um, Gary Francis Powers, who was our, our pi pilot um, there. And we cannot die. We do, a, we do a, a trade with them for a spy that we had captured. Now, the bigger thing that will end up happening, though, is that the Khrushchev, who had followed up Stalin and Eisenhower, were supposed to have a peace conference, and we were trying to go and ease things in the Cold War. That's going to get canceled, and the next few years will be the height of the Cold War. 
We will have the Bay of Pigs. We will have the Cuban Missile Crisis um, here. We will have the escalation starting soon afterwards in Vietnam uh, that we have. Um, Eisenhower in his last days will give a farewell address in January of 1961. And here he warns about the military industrial complex. And even today we still see things where he says to be wary of this. Are we, do we have groups that know they can profit like a, like a defense contractor? Um, an example that we'll have in, in for Vietnam will be um, Bell Helicopter and the amount of helicopters we'll use in Vietnam. But do we have things? Um, here just in the last few weeks we've had, had um, a debate about how much money that we have spent, which is now $1.7 trillion on the F-35 uh, fighter, which the Air Force and the Navy have pretty much said is useless. It just, it just is horrible and we're just wasting our money continuing to make this um, that we have. Alright, I showed this in, in um, class, the uh, old commercial for Bert the Turtle. This is actually one of the phrases in a, in a, for your state standards of things that you need to know for the Cold War. And it's a commercial and it's about the time period where we have and the idea that, that for bomb shelters and where in school that you are going to, to go and, and for, for covering. And that's where when we get to the height of the Cold War um, and the idea for, for the nuclear, nuclear war, what could be World War III. Uh, for what we'll have. All right, our last part is about McCarthyism. I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with that, the actual Joseph McCarthy, but McCarthyism is the idea that we have a hysteria about communism. Now, does it sound familiar? Yes, this is what had happened after World War I with, with the Red Scare. I always joke around and say this is the sequel, Red Scare II, McCarthyism. Um, here. And there's a lot of similarities that, that we had, where, where we had the Sedition Act in, in World War I, we had the Smith Act um, that was to go after Nazis in World War II, but that will then be used against communism. We're going to have a committee called the House Un-American Activities um, Committee. A young representative, Richard Nixon, is going to get, come to fame at that time as the Nazi hunter. Um, what they're doing is looking for things un-American. And I say in class, like if I was to ask everybody to write down what you say is un-American, on there. We'd have 25 different definitions. So a lot of these were things that maybe were just different, but if you were communist, socialist, anarchist, anything like that, this is where we're going after them. Um, this is where we're going to have groups. The ACLU is going to be arguing that this is against your liberties or your First Amendment rights. And this goes all the way back to Ben Franklin's idea of what's the difference between security and safety. And again, you can be, you can be very safe and secure, but then you're going to lose your liberties that you have. One of the first groups that's investigated will be the Hollywood 10. This is where we will have people in Hollywood that are accused of being communist. Um, if they refused to, to come, they were basically blacklisted. Many people lost their career. Today we know some of them support communism, but some of them didn't. And some of them were accused simply because they made a movie in World War II, paid for by the Office of War Information, to make it that was friendly to, to the Soviet Union um, that you'd have. We're also looking for other things, and this is where we're looking for spies. Now, we have two, two different, well, three different people, Alger Hiss, Julius Rosenberg, and Ethel Rosenberg. Alger Hiss was a person that worked in the State Department, and this is part of McCarthyism that we're going to be accusing people working in the State Department. And he's convicted of perjury, lying under oath, never of espionage. There was these papers that were found, and again, it almost sounds like a cartoon of he's hiding papers in a hollowed out pumpkin, so that's why they're nicknamed like the pumpkin papers uh, um, that you have. Now with Julius Rosenberg and Ethel Rosenberg, they're accused of, of being part of the spy ring that got information for the atomic bomb. Today we know we were actually right about that with Julius. Not Ethel, she wasn't involved, but Julius was, so we were half right. But they were convicted of it. Now, how do we know? Is after the Soviet Union dropped, we, the, the, the KGB, which is like the CIA for the Soviet Union, will open up some of their follows, followers. Now, this hysteria, um, that, or what some people thought was hysteria, was something part of McCarthyism and the idea that there are people that are out there against the U.S. government. And yes, there were some, but maybe not as much. All right, McCarthyism is something that, and the, and the idea that we have, it comes back. There are some people that will say that some of the things that we have had with the MAGA unit um, here with, and Trumpism 
is similar to it. Joseph McCarthy rises to fame quickly. He uses the fear of people. He is a dynamic speaker. He gets crowds of people coming with him. He is a rich man, but he's also fighting against the other rich men. He's fighting for the common man um, for what he'll have. But after the Hollywood 10, this is where he's going to accuse people in the State Department. He's going to say he has lists. He has a list and he has 205 people that he know are communists working in the State Department. Now for a lot of Americans, when you say, yeah, the people in Hollywood are different, people will, yeah, there's a lot of weird people in Hollywood. And for the State Department, who's accusing that? A lot of people kind of looked at that. They're suspicious of it. Normally, you're very highly intelligent, know multiple languages, working in the State Department, working overseas. So for a lot of people, they're distrusting of people that maybe are very intelligent, speak other language and that. So a lot of people went along with them there. And, Mac and McCarthy kept rising more and more to fame. He's pop more and more popular. And this is where, for Republicans, you pretty much either had to side with them or risk your career. That's where, like at this very moment, some people say that when it comes to if you're a Republican with Trump, um, that you have, that you can't really go away from, from him in here. He's going to help Republicans candidates win in the early 50s. But what ultimately will happen will be his accusations just keep going on until he accuses that there are a large number of people in the army. And he's saying, I've got lists, but he never has, never produces these lists. All it is is more and more accusations um, there. And each time that he gets called out, he just makes a bigger accusation. And the McCarthy, Joseph McCarthy himself, when he goes on to, and a lot of people watch the live hearings on TV, when he was with the Army, and the generals very commonly are denying things. And McCarthy just seems like he's more hysterical about everything. He soon will, will suffer or suffer the consequences from his um, raging alcoholism that he has. Um, there and he will fade, but the idea of McCarthyism and a witch hunt looking for for people is something that we see. And as again, this is kind of the red scare too, um, for what we have in this.